So welcome everybody to CS267. I'm Jim Demmel, and I'd also like to welcome not just the folks in this room, but the folks at 17 different universities at different states and countries who are taking this course right now, too, for credit, actually. They're local instructors at all those universities who will be giving grading uh, the final projects, which I will tell you about later today. So one of the reasons we're in this room is not just because it's big enough, but because there's all this equipment in the back which is recording all the lectures, and they're being broadcast live. So if you want to watch tomorrow, uh, Thursday's lecture in bed, that would be possible probably. And they're also all, all, all going to be archived. So in case you miss it or you want to listen to me again for some reason, then you can also go look at the YouTube videos. So um, one of the benefits of having put this course online before, the students at the 17 different universities are actually looking at the carefully edited version of this course from 2012, is that we had to build auto graders so that all those students will have their uh, homework and upload it and automatically get feedback on whether they got the right answer, whether it runs fast enough. And those same facilities will be available to you when you do your homework so that you can get immediate feedback before you turn it in. Okay. So here's the outline of, the core of today's lecture. I want to start by telling you why powerful computers must all be parallel processors. In fact, this is an old slide. It's actually all computers have to be parallel. And that includes not just big computers that do scientific and engineering computation. It includes your laptops and handhelds. So can you buy a sequential computer in, in anymore? I mean, does anybody own a sequential computer? There might be a few fossils, I don't know. But uh, basically, all computers have become parallel, and we have no choice but to deal with it, whether we like it or not. And so I'm going to give you a reason, some sort of technological history, about why that is, which is why we're all here. Then I'm going to talk about large computational science and engineering problems and why they need parallel computers. But in fact, it's not just science and engineering. It's all of commercial stuff, too. And I will give you a lot of examples of industry's interest in this and why they have funded large projects here at Berkeley. There, there's a bunch of seats in the middle and on the other side, if you folks want to sit. Um, and so um, I, I will have a lot of examples, not just today, but through the course of the semester, we will have guest lectures from some world's experts who will come and tell you about how they paralyze particular kinds of applications, you know, climate modeling and other things. So the reason you're here is that writing fast parallel programs is hard. It's not nearly as easy to write a program that does 100,000 things at the same time uh, fast. In fact, the computer that you're going to be using to do your homework can do 150,000 things at the same time. And uh, I'll tell you more about that computer later. It's called Hopper. It's at the Supercomputer Center at LBL up the hill. And so writing fast parallel programs is hard. And so things are getting better. A lot of people are working on making it easier to program. But in the meantime, you, you still have to know enough about the details underneath. They can't all be hidden from you yet. So that you, you know, have to know whether your program that you've written has a chance of running fast or not. So that is what we're going to be talking about. So let me now give you some metrics that we're going to use so we have a common language. And if you have a background in computer science, that's about half of you. Half of you are from outside of computer science. That's the way it's been for many years. We like it that way with a very broad mix of students. So this is, how, these, this is the terminology we're going to be using. So a flop, that's a floating point operation, usually double precision, 64-bit numbers. So when we ask how much work do we do, that's what we're going to be counting. We're going to measure how fast we go, typically by counting the number of floating point operations per second. So the computer that you're going to be using, well, I'll tell you how fast it is in a moment. There are a lot of zeros in, in how fast it goes. And then the size of the problem, I'm going to be using bytes. And a byte is 8 bits. And so, for example, a double precision number is 8 bytes. So the typical sizes that people use are powers of 1,000. These are the numbers I will be using throughout the semester to measure how long, how big things are. So back in the Bronze Age, when maybe you were little, a fast computer might, might have done a megaflop. It may have had a megabyte of memory. And today, the computer that you're going to be using for your homework uh, is a petaflop. So that's 10 to the 15th floating point operations per second. Um, when they first installed it three years ago, that was the fifth largest computer in the world. It's now number 29. That's how fast it's gotten slow. Not that it's gotten slower, but people keep building and installing new ones. And in fact, uh, in the Department of Energy is proposing in about three or four years from now to build an exaflop computer. That's 10 to the 18th. It's not clear who's going to build it first. It's probably going to depend on who can afford the electricity bill. And I'll tell you more about that later. 
So the current fastest publicly acknowledged machine runs at 55 petaflops, and it does 3.1 million things at the same time. So you can imagine there's something of a challenge on getting, you know, figuring out how to divide your problem up into three million things and coordinating them in an interesting way. So that, that machine is in China. And the up-to-date list, there's a race every six months where people try to race, and I'll tell you what the, what the metric is, what the benchmark is. And every six months they race, and it's all posted at the website top500.org. So, uh, now, one of the interesting issues I'll, I'll just add about this is there's going to be a new thing that's it's almost coming up in the petaflop world, but it will certainly come up in the exaflop world, is that if you have, let's say, a billion parallel processes going on at the same time, which is what people predict, chances are one of them is going to break. And so your program is going to have to somehow figure out how to keep running even though things are breaking all the time. That's not something we're accustomed to thinking about, but that's going to be the world in about three or four years. Okay, so that's the, tech, the terminology we want to use. And again, there are more seats over there if you'd like to sit on a, something softer than the floor. Okay, so this, again, is why powerful computers are parallel. This is the old version of the slide. This is data from uh, 91 to 2006. But starting in 2007, because of technological trends I'm going to tell you about, everything had to become parallel. So, so let me give you some history of what people thought was going to happen. And these are some famous bad quotes by famous people about where they didn't really see what was coming. So here's a quote by Thomas Watson, who was the founder of IBM back in 1943. He didn't think he could sell more than five computers. I mean, who's going to buy these things? So he was wrong. Now, going a little bit later to a company that is now defunct, for perhaps for good reasons, Ken Olson, the president of DEC, said, there's no reason for people to have a computer in their house. I mean, why would they want that? OK, so we know that was rather a bad prediction. So moving up to someone who is still around and very successful, Bill Gates, he said, why would anybody ever need more than 640K of memory? I mean, you know, what are you, what are you going to use that for? So that has, of course, that's in your wristwatch now. And finally, let me get to parallelism. This is a quote by Ken Kennedy, who is one of the pioneers of designing parallel software. And he said back in 94, is that he keeps getting asked why parallel computing isn't dead. You know, every few, you know, every year or two at that point in time, somebody would try to do a startup. They had a new idea for parallel computing, and they went bankrupt, right? So nobody would buy it. So the question is, why was that true back then, and what has changed? And so now I'm going to tell you a little bit more about the technology. And so let me tell you about something called Moore's Law. So Gordon Moore was one of the co-founders of Intel. And this is not exactly a law, but it's an observation that's been around for a long time and holds true. So he observed that the size of a transistor, which is sort of the basic building block that fits on going to a chip, the, or the density, so the number of transistors per square millimeter, was going to double every 18 months. So you could keep making computers, the same computer, smaller and smaller, or you could make them bigger and more powerful. And so here's a picture with some data to confirm that. The horizontal axis is the time in years. The vertical axis is the number of transistors uh, in a, uh, uh, on a fixed area of a chip on a log scale, and it's a straight line, and I'm going to have lots of log scales with straight lines drawing through them, so you can, the predictions you can take more or less seriously, but you can see this has worked held up for, for many, many years. So what does that imply about why computers got fast and why parallelism was a failure for so long? So let me just plot the data slightly differently. So here is, again, the horizontal axis is time and years. The vertical axis now has two things on it, transistors, that's Moore's law, and here is, well, it's a cloud of data up to the year 2000. I'll tell you what happens after 2000 soon. And if you let me draw a straight line through a cloud, it's following Moore's law roughly, doubling the density every 18 months. But that's not the only thing that was improving. The red line is the frequency. Everything was running faster. That was also getting better at a certain uh, rate. So that means that not only did you have more transistors going on, they were running your same old sequential program that many times faster every year. So you can imagine why people didn't need parallelism. The same old sequential program ran that much faster every year. When you didn't have to change your software. So let me be a little bit more specific about what all these improvements are. So this is sort of, you know, sort of the scaling laws for what happens when all these devices shrink, when the size of one edge of a transistor shrinks by a factor of x. Well, one thing is, why does it go faster? It's because the wires are shorter. You don't have to push the electrons as far. It doesn't take as much energy to push them. And so the, the clock rate also goes up by a factor of x. So, the transi so since it's an x by x transistor, the number of transistors per square millimeter, that goes up by x squared. 
And they also managed to manufacture them better, so the size of a chunk of transistors that you could, you know, that you could package up and put in somebody's microprocessor, that also went up by a factor of X. So altogether, the power of you know, one of these things that came off the assembly line was going up by a factor of X to the fourth. Now, they didn't let you see all of that. Some of it went into you know, manufacturing costs in a different way, but you saw, we all saw a factor of X cubed. And so that was devoted, well, making, making things go faster. Part of it was parallelism. They actually put hidden parallelism on the chips, something called instruction level parallelism. In other words, if your sequential program had a loop, and each iteration of the loop was doing a multiply or an add, and they didn't have anything to do with one another, think a dot product, then it would, have, it would say, oh, I can take four of these and do them at the same time, or eight of these and do them at the same time. And that happened automatically. You didn't have to do anything. That's where some of the speed up came from. That's, you, know, you can do simple programs that way. You can't do complicated ones. And the other thing that they improved on was something called locality. Now, we're going to spend a lot of time in the course talking about that. But it turns out that the most expensive thing on, this, on these computers or any computer is not actually doing the multiplies or doing the adds. It's getting the data from where they live in memory, bringing them together in the same place, you know, the adder or the multiplier, and actually doing the work. And that can take orders of magnitude longer than actually doing the multiplier or the add. And so what they spent a lot of, of, the, of these transistors doing was building lots of little memories on the chip so that you didn't have to move the data nearly as far so you could do the work. That's called locality. And so the point is most programs went this many times faster, you know, twice as fast every 18 months without you having to change your sequential program. That was a very good business model. So what walls did this run into? One of them was not only did the chips double in speed, but the cost of manufacturing them doubled too. So here on a log scale is the cost of building a factory to actually manufacture these chips. So the, the horizontal axis again is the year. And the vertical axis is the cost in millions of dollars to build the factory. And again, it's a, you know, only a few data points, but you can draw a straight line through it. So why was this? Well, there are certain physics things that happened. Um, the, here is a picture uh, of, a, of a chip, of a piece of a chip, which had a little wall there. That's a transistor that turns things on and off. It's 0.06 microns wide. Now, that's 600 angstroms. How many atoms can you fit in 600 angstroms? Well, not very many. So you can imagine that the cost of, of, you know, of making sure this is exactly perfectly manufactured and won't fail because maybe it's only you know, 500 angstroms wide or something and not enough atoms in it, that's pretty hard to do and keep making it narrow and narrow all the time. And so making, building these things to make them reliable was very expensive. And so in fact, when, the cell, when Sony came out with the cell processor, which is a very popular game station that people used, they had trouble manufacturing it. So it was a parallel machine and it had eight processors in it. But in order to sell it uh, and you know, have enough to sell, they had to say, well, we'll only promise that seven of them work. So they would manufacture it with eight. When it came off the assembly line, they would check them all. With high probability, seven out of the eight would work, and they would sell it with that promise. And so that's, that's how things worked. You had to pay extra to get an eight processor machine that worked. And so this is, this, this is one of the reasons the cost went up. Here's the other limit to making things run faster. And it's the power density. And this is perhaps you know, one of the other, the, the second most important thing. And so here is an old plot from IBM, which is, again, years on the horizontal axis. Vertical axis, the power density, again on a log scale, in watts per square centimeter. So how hot is your chip? And these yellow dots are actual chips that were being manufactured. And these were predictions that if people kept manufacturing them in the same way with all of those same scaling laws as before, how hot would they get? Well, this chip was actually like a hot plate. You can imagine how hot that was, how hard that was to cool. If they'd kept going, it would have been a nuclear reactor. Then it would become a rocket nozzle. And since it's a log scale and we can all draw straight lines and make predictions, it gets into the sun's surface eventually right? by, by some finite year. So this was enough to convince them that they couldn't keep manufacturing chips this way and have any hope of them working, let alone you know, being cool enough. So, so why was this? What was the underlying physical law that made this happen? And that's because that the power that's being generated is proportional to the product of four, four terms. Uh, yeah, well, three physical quantities, one of them squared. One of them is the voltage, the other one's the frequency, and the other one is the total capacitance of all the capacitance on the chip. And so increasing the frequency, which is one of those curves I showed you before, that was going up exponentially. It turns out that in order to do that, you have to increase the supply voltage. So this becomes a cubic effect. You know, even if you keep the chip area the same, same number of capacitors, the energy, the power per square centimeter is going up cubically. 
And so this was just you know, not going to work. You know. So let us now, so the data that I showed you before about how wonderful Moore's Law was only went up to the year 2000. And so now let me go past it and tell you what all of these effects did to the world of computing. So there's Moore's Law. The last plot I showed you went up to 2000. No, now it goes up to 2010. This is still the number of transistors per square centimeter. It's still going up. It's kind of a cloud, but it's still kind of a straight line. So Moore's Law continues to succeed. What about the frequency? So here's a plot of the frequency. And if you let me draw through it, it kept going on a straight line up until about 2004. Then they gave up, and it flattened out. So they stopped increasing the frequency, more or less, because of all those limits that I showed you. So, so why was that? So, well, so before I say why that was, here is the number of processors on a chip. So down here, it's pegged at one. These were sequential machines. And they finally said, you know, because it's much easier to program. You don't have to change your software. But finally, around you know, 2004, they said, we can't build them that way anymore. We have to put multiple cores, you know, up to 10, say, 8 or 10, on a single chip in order to you know, still make it run faster, given this limit of the clock speed. And so did they succeed in reducing the power? So finally, here's the power. And indeed, it was going up exponentially until it got too hot. And then it kind of sort of leveled off. And so that is the world that we live in now. OK. So let me say that these arguments you know, about why we have to have parallels, and they're not theoretical, these you know, clouds of data through which I've drawn straight lines saying we're living in this world now. And so any, all computer manufacturers are producing multi-core chips. Whether it's you know, a, a multi-core from Intel or an NVIDIA GPU, they're all doing many things at the same time. And so every machine is going to, you know, is going to live this way. And so this is a big problem for basically an entire piece of the economy. Because it used to be that the computer industry would just sell, replace everybody's computers every two or four years because people could run the same program twice as fast or four times as fast. So they were motivated to throw out their old machine and buy a new one. But now all the software has to change too. So imagine rewriting all software so that it become, become parallel. It's a much bigger economic obstacle than, than before. So, that, so this is not just for science, right? This is all of commercial stuff too. And, and so you know, as scientists, we're too small a part of the economic pot to make a big difference to Silicon Valley, right? They're driven by the rest of the market, and the rest of the market is making everything become parallel. So does this mean that every programmer, and there are a lot of programmers, is going to have to become a parallel programmer? It's, it's hard enough to write good sequential code and make it run fast. If you have to think about how to do 100,000 things at the same time, well, then, you know, and get that to be done efficiently, then that's going to be a much bigger challenge. And so we need a new software model. And so uh, a, about seven years ago, when this was becoming evident to industry, this was going to happen. Intel and Microsoft decided that they you know, wanted help. They didn't know what the answers were. And they put out a call for proposals to all the leading computer science departments in the country, asking for a proposal for a very large research center to address all these issues. And so we applied, and all the other great places applied, you can imagine. We won. And so we, had, we established a center called the Par Lab. And that ran for five years. We just had our closing party. Uh, we didn't solve all the problems. There's another big five-year project with, you know, also with many millions of dollars to work on to continue it. I mean, we, we made a lot of progress. We solved some of the problems, but there's still a lot of problems remaining. And so, so there's still a lot of work going. So the, the hope is, you know, the, the long-term goal is to hide all of this complexity that I've been telling you about from most programmers. Most programmers, and that certainly includes at least half of the folks in this room, don't want to worry about the details of where all the bits go and how fast they go, but we're not there yet. You still have to be aware of it to some extent before all the software tools become good enough to hide it all from you. So we can all just type A backslash B for anything, and it just all magically happens, right? So that's, we're not quite there yet. And so uh, that was the Par Lab that ran for, as I said, for five years. And the new project is called Aspire, and which is continuing with a number of the themes uh, that we came up with in the Par Lab and, you know, and has some new areas as well. And so there's uh, websites with that are on the class web page with lots of pointers to the ideas. And it's influencing not just industry, but a lot of the ideas have you know, shown up in the, not just this curriculum, but many other curricula too. So you'll be hearing about the, much more about this during the course of the semester. OK, so that's um, about parallelism and doing many things at the same time. One of the other obstacles is that the memory is also getting better, but it's not getting better nearly as fast. So, so as I said, there's Moore's Law, number of processors, uh, memory, uh, 
the number of transistors per square centimeter is still doubling every 18 months or so, but that's not true for memory. It's more difficult to manufacture that. So there, memory density is only doubling every three years. And here, here's, <coughs> excuse me, and here's a plot to show you that. So what that means is relative to the cost of computing, memory is getting harder and harder to produce. So what that means is that these new machines, very large parallel machines, are going to have less memory per processor. So we're going to have to figure out how to divide our problems into many, many smaller chunks where you only have a little bit of local memory to access. And remember, accessing memory is expensive. And so we're going to have to figure out how to do that. And so here are, here's another plot, which is the cost. Um, again, on a log scale of computation versus memory. And so here, the blue cost is the exponentially decreasing cost of doing computation. And there is the exponentially much slower decreasing cost of the memory. And so we're going to have to figure out how to do that. And one way that's going to show up in the course is that when we measure our, our success, you know, are we going faster? There are going to be two measures of scaling called strong scaling and weak scaling. Now, strong scaling says I have a fixed problem I want to solve. I want to, let's say, double the number of processors, get whatever memory, memory I have. Uh, can I go twice as fast? That would be perfect strong scaling. Probably not. So how close to that much faster can you go? If I 10 times the number of processors, how close to 10 times faster can I go? That goal is called strong scaling. How much better can you do to solve the same problem with more processors? But that's not the only thing that people want to do. In fact, in science, there's another thing that people often want to do, which is called weak scaling. So suppose that I have 10 times as many processors. They're all going to come with some more memory. Why don't I solve a, prob a different problem that's 10 times larger that I can fit in there? So that's a really common thing, for example, in climate modeling. So if, I ha if you hand a climate scientist a machine which has, which has 10 times as many processors, and each one of them has more memory, that climate scientist is going to use a finer resolution mesh to discretize all the equations on the Earth's surface and do better science by having a finer resolution model. And so what you say there is if I make the problem size, if I have 10 times as many processors, can I make my problem 10 times as large? How much can I solve that problem in the same time? That would be weak, perfect weak scaling. Okay, so, so depending on the kind of problem that we want to solve, we'll have two metrics of success as the semester goes along. How close do we get to strong scaling? How close do we get to perfect weak scaling? Okay. So let me just say one more thing, that uh, questions are welcome. Uh, this is a fast overview of the whole semester, so uh, I, if you just want to sit and listen, that's fine too. But since we are recording this, we have a microphone. Now, there are microphones in the ceiling, and they are supposed to catch your voice, but we're not going to necessarily trust them. So um, the teaching assistant, Razvan, and Aditya next to him have a microphone, so please feel free to raise your, unless it's a short question, which I can just repeat. If it's a longer question, please ask for the microphone, and then uh, that way it will get recorded, and the next student would will benefit from the answer as well. OK. So let, me, so let me go on and talk about the fastest computers in the world and what they look like. As I said, every six months, all the fastest computers in the world race. And there's a list of the 500 fastest ones. And there's a website, uh, top500.org. And so the question is, how do you measure who's faster than everybody else? You can't, so one measure is just the manufacturer's guaranteed not to exceed rate, right? But that's not that interesting because you may never get close to it. So there's actually a benchmark that everybody's agreed on, a program that everybody runs. You're allowed to tune it to your architecture as much as you like. And it's how do you solve a very large system of linear equations, solve AX equal B, using Gaussian elimination, an algorithm we all learned as sophomores, they don't actually use that algorithm. There's lots of interesting ways to make it go faster. We'll talk about that at some length. And that, in turn, turns out to be dominated by how fast you can multiply two dense n by n matrices. That's where Gaussian elimination spends all its time. And in fact, that will be the theme of the first home real homework assignment. You will explore that design space uh, to see what it takes to actually multiply n by n matrices. It turns out there's a lot of interesting ways to go about doing it. This list is updated twice a year. And I'm going to show you the data, and it's uh, presented at two supercomputing conferences. And I'm going to show you the list of the top 10 machines as of November 2013. So here are all the machines, uh, not the 500, the top 10. And I've, they're listed in decreasing order of who's fastest. And here is where they're located, including the country. There's who manufactured them, so there's a number of different manufacturers. 
All of these machines get their own personal names because they're all famous. And this, there's a little bit more data in here about you know, whose processors they use, whose network they use. And then many of these, in fact, are what are called heterogeneous. There's a mixture of, for example, Intel, regular old Intel processors, but maybe some accelerators, some GPUs built by NVIDIA. And so some of the work is done in one part, some is done in the other. This column is how many parallel processors are actually inside. They're called cores. So the fastest machine can do 3,120,000 things at the same time if you're very lucky. Okay, so the second fastest machine, <coughs> excuse me, machine is half a million and so forth, and it sort of uh, decreases on down. Here is the speed at which they can actually solve a system of equations. So the winner is 33.9 petaflops. And remember, the peak for this machine, I told you earlier, was 55. So it's getting 33 out of 55. Even for something as, as simple as gas elimination, it can't get any closer to peak than that. And it, you know, it decreases rather quickly. The top, the, you know, the tenth fastest is, you know, about ten times slower. And then the last column is very interesting. It's the power. How many megawatts does it take to turn this machine on and run this benchmark? And so you can see the top machine is 17.8 megawatts. And that's a big chunk of energy. There are very few places in the world that can, you can actually plug it into the wall and have that work. Now, all of these are, are at quite a few megawatts. So this sort of says that there's another metric which has become very important, which is saving energy. And so whether it's the battery in your handheld device that you don't want your, laptop, you know, your, hand, you know, your, battery, your cell phone to die, people in, in Silicon Valley are terribly worried about that, or whether you're running a data center or a supercomputer, because how much does it cost to run a megawatt machine? It turns out, on average, it's $1 million per megawatt per year. So you can look at this column as how many millions of dollars you just spend on the electricity bill. Uh, at least in the United States. And so the Department of Energy wants to build an exaflop machine. And so far, you know, it doesn't seem like they're going to get anywhere close to their energy budget. And being the Department of Energy, they have a sort of a limit. They don't want to spend more than, say, 20 million a year on the energy for this machine. But already, you know, you can see how close some uh, machines are getting to that. So um, the machine that the remote students are going to be using is uh, this one here, it's number seven on the top 500 list, Stampede at the Texas Supercomputer Center. And so now let me tell you what machine you're going to be using. I'll add one more row to this table. And it's at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. You can see it's number 28. I should say that when this machine was first installed and used in this class three years ago, it was number five on the list. So it has shrunk. It, the machine hasn't shrunk, but the number of new machines installed has made it drop that far in three years. And so it's also a one petaflop machine, so, and it also has, has 100, 150,000 cores in it. So it will present all the challenges that you need in order to learn how to do parallel computing. So, let me sh so this is just the top 10. Let's look at the trends over time. And so here is the performance of starting from the, when they first started collecting this data back in the early 90s up to uh, uh, last November. Uh, vertical axis is the log scale performance. Here is number one. Okay, so there's the fastest machine in the world. There's number 500, and there's the sum of the 500 fastest machines. So, so it's not a whole lot more than number one. And so this is kind of following the exponential trend that you'd expect from Moore's Law, except there are a few flat places, and you can probably guess why that happened. So in this year, somebody built a really fast machine, and it set the world's record for five years. This was the Earth simulator in Japan. But you know, over time, it kind of averages out. And so, so back in 94, the fastest machine in the world was, what was that, like about 57 gigaflops? I mean, that's your laptop with a GPU in it, right? So that was the fastest machine in the world back then. And the, uh, you know, today, as I said, the fastest one, this is to solve AX equal B, is around 33.9. So these look like nice straight lines. Let's do the usual prediction and draw straight lines on this curve and a log scale. So here's what it will be. And so when do we hit an exaflop, which is the target that the DOE wants? So there's an exaflop. And so, let's see, is that right? No, sorry, number one, this guy. 2018, that is their target. They would like to be able to build an exaflop machine by 2018. But as I said, this assumes that you can afford the electricity bill, which is way over 20 megawatts, $20 million a year. So DOE is hoping for a new technology. We'll see what happens. So let me tell you some other you know, pieces of, of information from this. So here is a plot of how parallel all these machines were over time. The whole top 500, so the vertical axis is the number of machines, horizontal axis is years, and it's color-coded by how many, 
how parallel they were. So this color here are all the machines that had one processor and still made it in the top 500 list. So back in 93, there were 100. 100 of the fastest machines in the world only had one processor. Uh, another 50 or so had two processors. This purple band here, which you know, it shows up, had, they had about 33 to 64. But you can see that you know, they die out quickly. So the, the fastest machines in the world that had one core, well, they weren't on the list two years later, three years later. The fastest machines that only had two processors, they all died out about the same time. Here, the ones that had 33 to 64, they were all gone by 2003. So let's look at 2010. And so this big band here, which is most of the top 500, that's 4,000 to 8,000 processors. And there are a few down here at 2,000 to 4,000. But if you want to get you know, really near the peak, already back three years ago, four years ago, you needed at least 100,000 processors. So this is sort of a, a measure of you know, parallelism's increase that is showing up that we're all going to have to deal with. OK, so let me just kind of try to uh, summarize. Moore's law here and what it all means to us. So the number of cores per chip can double every two years. The clock speed is not going to increase anymore. It may even possibly decrease if the energy becomes a problem. We're going to have to deal with systems with millions of concurrent threads. The world's record is already somebody with three million uh, things going on at the same time. And the exascale predictions for 2018 are one billion processors going on at the same time. Now, it's not as though you're going to have one billion identical processors all doing that. They're not all going to be the same. So you're going to have certain processors that are large number of processors on a single chip. And those are going to be programmed probably in one way. Then you're going to have a whole bunch of chips on a board. And how you, you know, coordinate you know, going off chip across the board, which is pretty far away, takes a while. That's going to be an interesting question. You're going to have multiple boards in a rack. And a rack is a big, tall kind of thing that sits on the machine room floor. And you're going to have many, many racks in these big machine rooms. So all these machines are going to be hierarchical. They're going to have different levels of parallelism. They might have different programming models. They do now. This is painful. But they have different programming models at every level. Depending on how far away the memory is, it gets more and more expensive to get the data. And so right now, you know, it would be nice if this were all hidden from you by the software, but it's not. And it's, we're just going to have to live with that for a while. OK. So that ends the first part of the talk. Are there any questions before I go on to next part, which is why large problems need large computers, and not just computational science and engineering, but commercial problems too? So let me uh, take a quote out of a cover article of Nature from uh, uh, 2006. And it makes the observation, which is probably pretty trite by now, that computer science is becoming part of regular science, whatever that is, so chemistry and biology and physics and all of that. And that's because the data being produced by these other fields is simply too large, or the problems are too hard to do in any other way except large-scale simulation. You have no choice but to use large computers to deal with it. And so um, there are two reasons for that. One of them is that uh, the increase in computational power says that we can do things in the computer that theory just, you know, you can't solve it by hand anymore. You can't do the experiments, perhaps. Maybe they're uh, you know, too dangerous or too large. And the other reason is that Moore's law is not just making computers go faster. It's, make, it's letting us build more sensors, because sensors are just computers. And so, for example, at the Joint Genome Institute, which is part of Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, they can put DNA sequencers on a chip and collect enormous amounts of information about DNA that's also increasing exponentially every year. And I'll have some more data on that later. And, and no human can deal with that. So the amount of the exponentially growing data has to be dealt with by exponentially growing computers as well. Um, they're planning to put up uh, gigapixel uh, cameras on satellites. We'll have a guest lecturer on the Planck satellite, which has gone up very recently, collecting vast amounts of data looking at the cosmic microwave background radiation. Uh, that's already won Berkeley two Nobel Prizes. And of course, it'd be nice to win another one. Uh, and, and so that, that also generates vast amounts of data. And of course, the web itself, uh, you know, sociological data, that's, that's also growing very large. And so we need to analyze all that. And so this paper used the following phrase. It's rather grandiose terminology. They're calling computing the third pillar of science. So what are the other two pillars? They're what we learned back in junior high school. They're theory and experiment, right? So either, or in, in the case of engineering, it would be a paper design versus actually building the system to see how well it works. And so the problem are, it's, it's too difficult to do these things. Taking an engineering example, you 
it's too hard to build a large wind tunnel to, so you can fit a Boeing 787 inside of it to make sure it can fly, right? You have to make sure it flies by running a large fluid dynamic simulation ahead of time. It's too expensive. You have to make sure that when that plane comes off the assembly line that it really works, except maybe for the batteries. That's not Boeing's problem. Uh, so, because you can't afford to rebuild it. Uh, it may be too slow. We can't afford to wait for the climate to change to see what happens. We'd really like to know the answer ahead of time, so we maybe you can make some changes. And of course, galactic evolution is even a longer time scale. And it may be uh, too dangerous to do the experiments. There is a test ban treaty. All work on certain kinds of weapons is done by uh, doing simulations. The same thing with drug design. There are certain things that you can't do you know, with uh, people or animals, and so they're done that way. And of course, climate experimentation. Some people are proposing shooting large amounts of very shiny, silvery dust into the atmosphere to reflect away all the light. And it'd be good if we did a simulation of that first to see if it was a good idea before we actually try it. So, and you can imagine ma many other e examples as well. So this is, these are sort of the examples that motivate being here. So let me give you some numbers for some of these examples. Um, and so, and why these petabyte data sets are becoming very common. <coughs> So I mentioned climate modeling. So the next intergovernmental panel on climate change, that's the people who get together every four years and write these big reports, they're having tens of petabytes of data that they're generating from satellites and ground sensors and all those other things, and the output of the climate models themselves. And I'll show you some cool videos of the kind of climate model output soon. So the Joint Genome Institute, as I said, they're building chips that do DNA sequencing. Moore's Law says they're doubling the amount of data they have very rapidly. So they're going to have, I think this is two years ago, they had half a petabyte of data, and that's going to be doubling every year to run the sequencing algorithms on. For particle physics, the Large Hadron Collider is going to produce 16 petabytes of data per year. For a while, they were looking for neutrinos that went faster than the speed of light. They gave that up. Then they looked for the Higgs boson. That seems to have worked. And, and there's so much data that they can't even get it out of the machine room. They, they have to throw most of it away by doing some very rapid processing, and then it's shipped to a supercomputer somewhere else, because that's just too much data for the network to deal with. And in astrophysics, um, this particular project, the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope, as I mentioned, is putting up these gigapixel cameras, aiming them at the sky, and trying to look at the cosmic microwave background radiation to say what the fate of the universe will be. And um, so all of that data is just becoming enormous. So here are some examples, some of which we're going to have more examples. We're going to have uh, guest lectures. As I mentioned, we're going to have a climate scientist, uh, Mike Weiner from Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. He's going to come and, and talk about some of the challenges that they have. Uh, biology and genomics, I've mentioned before. We will also have um, Julian Burrill, who's uh, an astrophysicist who's uh, coming back from a meeting on the Planck satellite, I think uh, coming back today. And so as soon as I figure out when he can give a guest lecture, it'll probably be later in the semester. And he'll talk about this work, which, as I said, led to two Nobel Prizes in the past. So computational chemistry is something that people do quite a bit of at LBL and elsewhere and on campus. You want to solve Schrodinger's equation to predict the behavior of, of materials. And there's a particular materials project that I want to tell you about. Uh, and we will have a guest lecture again from LBL. So there are many, many people in different parts, you know, in different labs who are building, you know, doing studies of particular parts of a molecule or particular kinds of materials, what they'd like to do is build a whole machine or contraption out of it. So what they'd like to do is sort of find the materials that aren't exactly like theirs, but can be put together, they interact correctly, so they can build a larger device. And so what they really want is a Facebook for materials. They want to have materials that can find friends that they can interact with. And, uh, and they've actually built that, and it's very popular. And so what people do is large simulate their own materials, they upload certain um, material science data, and you can automatically search for which materials can kind of go together and have certain properties. And so uh, uh, Kristen Pearson from LBL will be talking about that. For uh, semiconductor design, as I mentioned, there's a large amount of simulation. If you're from the EE department, this is sort of old news. You do a large amount of simulation before you build, you know, try to manufacture these chips. Um, the folks in civil engineering have a big parallel program uh, project called Open Seas. Uh, where they uh, do parallel simulation of the response of bridges to uh, earthquake, uh, uh, earthquake forcing. And they asked, if I design the building this way, is it less likely or more likely to fall down than if I build it a different way? Um, and we have folks at LBL doing a large amount of work on combustion, so you can build more efficient internal combustion engines. And of course, for crash simulation, you would like to make sure that your car is going to be safe. And I will have some data on the next slide about how much money they save by actually doing that particular one. 
So in business and finance, high-speed trading. I don't, probably don't have to tell you about that, be it good or bad. And in the defense business, I already mentioned nuclear weapons, and then there's cryptography. I guess the question is, do you want to make it safer or do you want to break the cryptography? So there's, th those are also among the largest computers in the world, but they don't appear on the top 500 list. They're not public. <laughs> so what can I say? So, so here are some numbers that have been collected by various uh, economists to try to say, what is the benefit of doing large-scale simulations in different industries? So in the airline industry, their goal is to make sure all their airplanes not only work, I mean, that's Boeing's problem, but that they get where they're supposed to and they're all up in the air you know, as, as, as much larger fraction of the time as possible. So that's a very large-scale optimization problem to make sure everybody is, is busy and you're not waiting in line. We know what that feels like. And the estimate is $100 million per airline per year by doing these scheduling problems as opposed to sort of having some human sit, sit there and do it. In the automotive business, um, you have to make sure, this is you know, required by the government, that your car has certain behavior in a crash, that it, you know, you're safe depending on whether you crash at a certain speed or not, and whether the car hits you from the side or not. And so they, that's all done with large-scale finite element modeling and with hundreds and hundreds of processors. And, um, and so you can see how this works. And the, the guess there is it saves them a billion dollars per company per year. So when they finally do the actual physical crash test, it works the first time. They don't have to go back and rebuild the car because they've tested it in the machine. The semiconductor industry, as I said, you know, simulates all the chips before they build them. Uh, that's a big industry in Silicon Valley, and it saves companies like Intel a billion dollars per year from not having to make all those mistakes. And uh, the energy business is doing it as well. So the, the actual data comes from an organization called IDC, which is the International Data Corporation. And they are the ones who actually call all these companies and say, well, how do you spend your money? And it's, it's hard to get the data, so this is pretty old. It only goes up to 2004. And it says what fraction of the money that was spent in their IT budget uh, was done. So it looked at all these companies in different areas and, and said, what fraction of the, all the high performance computing in the country is done by, for example, R&D? Is it done by mechanical design? That's the yellow part. Is it biosciences? That's a very large part. Chemical engineering, uh, classified defense. Well, I don't know why they can get those numbers. And, and so, but this is just to show you over time how these you know, different industries are using all these things. So now, uh, and you can look at this in, in more detail later. And I should say, there is a student who's enrolled in this class from the Haas Business School. And we had a student who was enrolled in this class several years ago. And his thesis, he's now a professor at the Sloan School at MIT. And his uh, class project, which eventually turned into part of his thesis, was to ask, was to look at different industries, to ask what kinds of simulations they did, and to ask, were they ready to go parallel? Were their simulation software tools capable of become par becoming parallel? And would that affect their competitiveness in the market? And so there's, that's, that's a, you know, was an interesting class project that I hadn't anticipated, but it turned into something quite interesting, at least the people who hired him at MIT also thought so. OK. So let me uh, go into a little bit more detail about two projects. One of them is climate modeling, and the other one is cosmic microwave background radiation. And so the, here's the climate modeling problem in a little bit more mathematical detail. So I want to compute a function, f. And that function tells me the weather. And it's a function of four parameters, which is well, where I am. That's three parameters, latitude, longitude, and elevation, and then also the time. And the weather is a tuple. And you can imagine it contains a lot of data. But the simplest thing it could contain is the temperature, the pressure, the humidity, and wind velocity. And you could add all sorts of other chemical tracer elements and whatever you wanted. And so how does one generally solve a problem like this? Well, you discretize the domain. What we're going to do is put down a mesh that covers the entire Earth's atmosphere and other things too. So every, let's say, 10 kilometers, you'll have a mesh point. And at every one of those mesh points, you will have a value of these four quantities. And so what we, so at, at every 10 kilometers in every direction, and maybe for every you know, kilometer in, in altitude, or 100 meters in altitude, you'll have a tuple of four numbers. And what we need now is an algorithm that says, suppose I have all of that information, all of the Earth's climate at time t, how do I update it to time t plus delta t, so a minute from now? And then you just keep iterating that algorithm, and eventually you get these pretty movies that say how the climate is going to evolve. And of course, we know what we want to do this for. I mean, we want to predict the weather. That's where they run this for a week. You want to predict major events. Can you tell whether El Nino is going to be there or not? It's used for setting air admission standards. And of course, global warming. What should we do about that? So one piece of this 
and it's actually a very little piece, the equation that I just showed you is solving the Navier-Stokes equation. So if, you, if you're not familiar with the Navier-Stokes equations, don't worry about it. They're a set of differential equations, and they will let us update from time t to time t plus delta t those various quantities that I showed you, the pressure, the, t the temperature, and the wind velocity. So all I need to know in order to say how big a machine do I need to solve it, I don't need to know, I don't need to know the details in the Navier-Stokes equations. All I need to, do, need to know is how much work it does at every mesh point to take all that data, those four numbers, you know, temperature, pressure, humidity, velocity, and so forth, and update them to be one minute uh, in the future. Right? So you get your data from your neighbors, and then you, 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 know, you do some algebra, and then you get the updated value of, of the weather. And it turns out it takes about 100 floating point operations to do that at every mesh point. That's, that's all we need to know. So now, let's suppose, let's ask ourselves, how big a computer do I need, knowing only that, in order to do climate modeling? So, so the baseline is, how big a computer do I need to predict the weather in 24 hours, and I'm willing to take 24 hours to do it? That's sort of like, you've got to go at least that fast. Otherwise, it's not very interesting, right? So I want a computer that's big enough to run, solve these equations in real time. So that's all I want. So, what we, what, so the, how do you do that? Well, you can count how many mesh points there are. If there's every 10 kilometers, you can figure that out. And let's suppose there's 1,000 layers from the, from the uh, uh, bottom of the atmosphere, from the Earth's surface up to the top. And so you can count how many mesh points that, those are. You can count, you say, 100 floating point operations per mesh point. And we're going to do that in, we're going to take one time step. And I need to do that in one minute, because one time step is one minute. And that turns out to be you need an 8 gigaflop machine. That's not very big. You can, you know, our laptops will do that. But now, let's suppose that I want to do weather prediction. So I want to go faster than real time. So let's suppose I'm willing to take 24 hours to predict the weather in seven days. That's, you know, that's still not very fast, but it may be good enough. So I have to go seven times faster, and seven times eight tells me 56 gigaflops. So what if I want to do climate prediction? Let's suppose I'm willing to wait 30 days to get the weather in 50 years, right? So I can ask, how many times faster do I go? I'm up to 4.8 teraflops. And what if I'm you know, sitting in a UN committee and I want to use it in some policy negotiation, so I'm talking to the ambassador next to me, I say, well, what if we change the rule on, you know, on, on carbon sales you know, this way? What would that do? So what you'd like to be able to do is go home overnight, run a simulation of what that would do, so you have 12 hours to do it, not 30 days, and that brings you up to 288 teraflops to do it. So, so this was not a very fine grid. It also missed most of the stuff that's going on in the ocean and, and, the, and the sea ice and what the humans are doing. But let's just ask ourselves, let's suppose I wanted to make it twice as fine a resolution because 10 kilometers is still not very fine resolution. I mean, a lot of weather can happen in a 10 kilometer range. So let's suppose I want to go from 10 kilometers to five kilometers. How much more expensive will it get? Well, in each direction, I'm going to have twice as many grid points. So that's two times two times vertical also changes. Two, that's eight times as many grid points. So it's going to be at least eight times expensive. But that's not the only thing. You have another property, which in a math course would be called the CFL condition. You have to make the time step smaller. You can't keep just jumping by a minute. You have to jump actually twice as fast, 30 seconds. So it's actually a factor of 16 to go uh, to predict the weather at that finer resolution. And so this quickly gets much, much larger. And of course, real climate models have, this is, as I said, a very small fraction of what they do. They also have uh, clouds. I didn't put anything in here about clouds. We actually have a new faculty member who's an expert in cloud computing, both those kind of clouds and the other kind of clouds. He uses those. And, uh, and also oceans, and that, that's another huge mesh you have to discretize. Sea ice, land models, all the plants, you know, what humans do, that you can model that forever. And so they, they can use all the flops that you want. And in fact, so coarser, uh, current models, because they have all this other stuff, are much, much coarser than 10 kilometers. So let me show you some pictures. So here's some climate modeling that was done on a machine, again, at NERSC. That's the LBL computer, the supercomputer center, whose machine you're going to be using now. This was done a number of years ago. And so this is the wintertime precipitation that they predicted in millimeters per day. The first model they tried out was not 10 kilometers, but 300 kilometers, right, to see what that looked like. And so you can see here's, here was the rainfall. So more rain up here in the Pacific Northwest. Seattle's wet. We know that. Then they went to 75 kilometers. Then they went to 50 kilometers. And here's the actual observations. And so you can see that there is kind of sort of convergence to something. 
but 50 kilometers are still pretty far away from you know, being able to see what's going on there in the Sierras versus the Central Valley, for example. And so they can keep on going forever. So let me now show you uh, an animation of a simulation of the hurricane season. So, doesn't work in PowerPoint. So this is initialized to data on August 3rd, 1979. And so let's just watch it. And so the data that is being, so there's so much data, right? So what am I showing you? This is color coded by the total amount of water vapor in a column of the atmosphere. So white means there's an awful lot of water there, lots of clouds, maybe a hurricane. And let me just play it again. I'm looking for it. I'm not seeing it. Uh, voila. Voila. Thank you. So they ran this at many resolutions. And on the uh, web page, we'll have, or on, uh, when Mike gives his lecture, he'll show you what happens to the simulation when it's done at many resolutions. So the question is, does this have anything to do with, actu with what actually happened during the hurricane season back in 1979? So basically, it got the statistics right. So that's about all you can ask from climate modeling. It didn't actually, you know, you know, when it said there is a hurricane here, you can see what one, you can imagine one of those swirly white things is a hurricane. It didn't actually happen on that day, but from a statistical point of view, they got it right. So this simulation was done with something, with a piece of code called uh, uh, NCAR's Community Climate Model. So NCAR is a national organization that sort of builds open source software that anybody can download and take and do these simulations. And so if you're interested in climate modeling, then um, Mike, there are a bunch of people on campus and at LBL who, you know, you can go in and tinker with the software all you like and see if you can make these simulations run better. So let me now go on to uh, the uh, Nobel Prizes that I referred to. And so this is cosmic microwave background radiation. And so one of the questions that this will answer to you is that what is the fate of the universe? So we know that there, or we think we know, there was a big bang once upon a time, about 13.7 billion years ago. The, we all fit in a tiny little dot, smaller than the proton, then it began expanding and it blew up and it's been expanding ever since. And so the question is, how do they figure that out? And what do they think is going to happen in the future? So there are kind of uh, at least three scenarios. One is the universe keeps expanding forever. So you go out into the sky, you look, go outside at night, and you look up at the sky, and it's empty, right? So that's certainly one possibility. The other possibility is that it starts shrinking again. And so you go out in the sky at night, and you look up in the sky, and you say, uh-oh, we're going to have another big bang, and it's all going to collapse again. And it'll go periodically. And, the other, and there's a third possibility, which is sort of that it keeps expanding, but it slows down asymptotically, so it sort of goes into a steady state. And what you can do is sort of figure that out based on the distribution of the cosmic microwave background radiation. And they decided that the data was consistent with that third scenario. It would expand forever, but slow down gradually. And so when they did this, um, this was a large high-performance computing simulation. Um, back in, at this point in time, you could do it on your laptop today. But at that point, it was a very large, uh, large data analysis. And here is a picture of, of the map of the cosmic microwave background radiation. So please ignore the Milky Way in the middle. And it's all this other stuff, which is non-uniform, right? So this is sort of the radiation coming back from the Big Bang. And by analyzing that, they could somehow decide uh, the difference between these different scenarios. So that's the data from 1992. Here's the current data, which is rather more uh, highly resolved. And Julian will be talking about this later. And so here they can measure the anisotropies at a much finer resolution. And, and these are measured in microkelvin, right? So they, these are very small things that they measure by putting up satellites or balloons and aiming a, a, a very you know, sensitive camera at every pixel in the sky and measuring how much radiation is coming back. So, so let me show you what the size of the data is and tell you what actual computation they do. So here is sort of a history of how big the data sets are. 
going from 1989 to 98 to Planck, which is uh, the project that is ongoing now where they have a very big satellite up there. Boomerang was, I believe, a big uh, balloon that they put up over, over the uh, poles. And so these numbers here tell you kind of how big the data sets are. So this is the number of time samples that they managed to take, so about a billion time samples. And what they did is by moving the camera around, they came up with this many uh, pixels on the sky. So it's about a uh, 6,000 uh, pixels. So there, that was that picture I showed you before. So 6,000 isn't very much for the whole universe. So the question is, what do you do? What is the actual computation they did with those 6,000 signals in order to do the analysis? So what they did is they formed a 6,000 by 6,000 matrix. So there was one matrix entry for every pair of pixels. And what did they put in the matrix entry? They took the radiation signal from pixel I and pixel J, and they just computed the correlation. So it was just a symmetric matrix, and each entry was a correlation of those two radiation signals. And then they asked, what are the eigenvalues of that matrix? And it turns out that the distribution of those eigenvalues told you which fate of the universe was, you know, which theorem of the, of the universe was consistent with that data, because that's what they predicted. Um, so now, if you go up to Planck, it would be a 6 times 10 to the 8, so a 6 100 million by 600 million matrix if they decided to form it that way. So the algorithms, finding the eigenvalues of a matrix, you know, scales like the cube of the dimension, they, they can't use that algorithm anymore. So they have to do something else. But that's one of the things that makes these, these problems interesting. Okay, so, so this is, uh, okay, so I will let Julian expand on this table later. So the question is, how are we going to, uh, so these are two scientific applications. And when the Parlab began, we sort of looked at all the experience that the scientists had had when they tried to parallelize these things. And I as I just mentioned, for this particular one, it turned into a dense linear algebra problem. You know, find the eigenvalues of a large symmetric matrix. And it turns out that one of our colleagues at LBL, Phil Colella, had looked at a large number of different scientific applications and had asked the question, well, what are they really spending all their time doing? You know, not just dense linear algebra, is there, but is there a short list of all the things that they do? And it turns out that there are, there's just seven. And so here is a, a bit of a cartoon which says, what are the seven dwarfs, he called them, that all high performance computing applications do? And it turns out that by looking at a large number of them, so look at the red boxes, they did operations on dense matrices, they did operations on sparse matrices, they did FFTs, spectral operations. They did n-body algorithms, you know, you know, gravitational force among n particles. They did work on structured grids, averaging with your north, south, east, and west neighbors. And they did operations on unstructured grids, so think finite element co codes, where you have a little bit more irregular structure. And they did something, this is modern terminology, MapReduce. That really just means embarrassing parallelism, or think Monte Carlo. Everybody does something independently, then you collect the data and average it or something. And these were the seven things that all high-performance computing applications did. So the starting point of the PAR lab was to say, OK, seven, that's good enough for high-performance computing. What about the rest of Silicon Valley? What about all the other applications that people do you know, to sell these machines? Let's look at those and say, what are the patterns that appear there? And so over a period of years before the PAR lab started, a whole group of faculty and students got together, and we looked at embedded computing. We looked at the spec benchmarks, which are a popular set of benchmarks that people use to measure machines. We looked at databases. We looked at computer games, machine learning. These you know, are very you know, intense computations. And it turns out that all seven of those original dwarfs appeared. So you, know, you can see dense linear algebra, dense matrices, they appear almost everywhere. So red means they are used a lot. Orange means they're used a bit. Green means eh, they're used a little bit. And blue means they're not used so much. But they all appeared. And there were only six more. So it turns out there were only 13 patterns in which we currently still believe you can decompose all these different applications. And that observation was not just important for this research project. It's sort of the basis of this course, too, and, and other courses. These are the patterns that you're going to need to recognize to figure out how to uh, compose, put together, you know, find the best existing implementations. I mean, people have already written libraries for some of these, not all. And this is what you're going to decompose your applications into. So what are the other six? Well, there's something called finite state machines. So if you're in computer science, that's probably familiar. But you, know, every, you have a whole bunch of vertices. They, they represent the state of a particular system. At every time step, you get some data from your neighbors, and you update your state. So that, that appears very often. Combinational logic, Boolean algebra, that appears a lot. 
graph traversals. Graphs appear many places, so breadth first search and depth first search and many other operations traversing graphs and doing operations in the edges. Um, dynamic programming is a uh, very popular optimization scheme where you divide a big problem into small ones, solve the small problems, put it back together again. It's kind of like divide and conquer. Um, backtracking, branch and bound search, that's very popular in all sorts of optimization problems. So you think of a game, I can either move my chess piece that direction or that direction. Each one of those takes you down a different subtree in this big search. And that's called backtracking, branch and bound. And graphical models is kind of a shorthand for a lot of algorithms that come up in machine learning, where you're trying to sort of optimize a probability of understanding something. So there were a total of 13, and we asked ourselves, what should we name these? And then we realized that there were still 13 dwarfs in The Hobbit by Tolkien, so we could still call them dwarfs, but we just didn't want to get married to 13, right, or seven, because maybe next year we'll have 14. Uh, but in the meantime, um, uh, 13 has stuck around for quite a while. These, these are pretty popular patterns. And so, but now we call them motifs or patterns. But the seven dwarfs are still the seven dwarfs. So what did we do in the PAR lab in order to test our hypothesis that this is all you needed? We chose several applications, and we decomposed them and parallelized them you know, using these, these particular patterns. And some of these are going to be discussed later in the course. So we looked, for example, at image processing. So what is the application here? You have a, you have a um, big database of pictures in your cell phone. And you say, please find all the pictures of my sister, you know, and my, uh, my sister Jane and her friend Joe, no matter where they happen to be in the picture, they just happen to be standing in the same picture together. And here's a picture of Jane, here's a picture of Joe, just go find them for me. That turns into a very large parallel computation problem that uses dense linear algebra, it uses structured grids, it uses all these different things. So that was the image processing application. In speech, you would like to be able to show up to a lecture like this, be a little bit sleepy, have your cell phone take notes, and come back with a transcript of everything I said and fix all my errors. Right? So that's speech recognition. Um, music, I'm glad to say that there is a graduate student in music who's enrolled in this class. And music was also one of the applications. So this little tiny picture here is a picture of a uh, 120 tweeter speaker that hangs from your ceiling. It does real-time beam forming. It, what it does is it sends out a beam and it sort of samples your room so it knows how everything bounces off. And then you can say, please make, please do the beam forming so that when you play this piece of music, my living room sounds like the fourth row at Carnegie Hall, if that's where you happen to want to sit. And so you can sort of make your room have any acoustics that you want. I believe that's now a commercial product. Um, there's also a browser. There's a lot of parallelism in browsers. And this is a, a health app of which there are a great many. This particular example happens to be doing the simulation of the blood flow in the brain of a stroke victim. When they come into the hospital and you take a, uh, a scan of their brain, you would like to do the fluid dynamics to know how to best treat them. So that's also uh, uh, an example, one of many, that comes up in the health application. OK, and so we will discuss some of these over the course of the semester so that you can see why. So we're going to spend some of our time understanding how do you parallelize these particular patterns, and some of our time saying how do you compose them into particular applications to make them run fast. OK, so, but it's still, despite that insight that there's sort of 13 patterns, writing fast parallel programs is still hard, and even though things are improving. So here are the big problems that are going to come up because the software can't hide them all from you yet. First one is finding enough parallelism. So, so suppose that you have a problem that you want to parallelize, and you have a 1,000 processor machine, and you've done a really good job. You can find 99% of it that you can parallelize perfectly. How much faster will it go? there's still 1% that's running sequentially, you can still only go 100 times faster, right? No matter how much you parallelize the parallel part, you're going to be, the bottleneck is going to be the sequential part. That's called Amdahl's law, a very simple observation. So we have to be able to find enough parallelism. But there's also the danger that you find too much parallelism. So suppose I want to multiply two n by n matrices. We have to do n cube multiplications. They're all independent of one another. And you say, great, I, if I have if I want to multiply 2,000 by 1,000 matrices and I have a billion processors, I'll simply ask each processor to do one multiplication. But it turns out that the cost of going to each of those processors, sending them the two numbers you want them to multiply, you know, waking up that processor, waiting for the data to come back can be orders of magnitude more than the time it takes to do the multiplication. One multiply is not enough work. It's not a big enough task to send to a parallel processor. We have to pick the right size. I mean, you have to pick the size small enough so you can keep all your processors busy, 
But you have to pick it big enough so you're not overwhelmed by the overhead. So picking the right granularity is important. Uh, that ties in with locality. Moving data costs more than arithmetic, orders of magnitude more. So we'll talk about that. The other issue is load balance. Uh, suppose you've done a really great job. You have 1,000 processors. You've managed to, to assign work to 999 of them. It's almost the same. They're all going to finish at the same time, except there's one guy who has twice as much work to do. The 999 are going to finish and wait for the slow one, and you're going to go at the rate of the slow one. And so we have to worry about load balancing. Um, coordination and synchronization. So think of that matrix multiply problem. I have 1,000 numbers I need to add up to get the dot product for each entry of the matrix. So I have 1,000 processors, each one number. How do I add up all those 1,000 numbers? Well, you could imagine there's a global sum sitting somewhere in memory. So one processor goes and gets the sum, increments it, puts it back. Each processor tries to do that. Suppose two processors go and get the global sum, increment it, and then they both put it back. One of those increments is going to get missing. And so that's a problem that we have to worry about. And then, even if you've done a very careful job, the chances are that when you run it, it's going to run slower than you thought, slower than you'd hoped. So it turns out there are a lot of tools, and we will have a guest lecture on all these tools that automatically try to find where are the bottlenecks in your code, despite your best efforts to you know, write it fast. And that's usually an iterative process. You write your code, you run the tool that says where the bottlenecks are, and you try to fix it. So all of these things make parallel programming harder than sequential programming. So sorry, but that's the current state of the art. So modern machines do try to do some of this automatically for you. So as I mentioned, uh, if your program happens to have a loop in it, which happens to be doing a bunch of independent, let's say, multiplies in a dot product, your hardware will recognize that for you automatically. And it will say, oh, I can take eight iterations of this loop and do all eight of them at the same time because I happen to have eightfold parallelism built into my, into my chip, and the user doesn't have to worry about that. That has its limits. It, it can't recognize more complicated things than simple loops at the, at the moment. And that's called uh, instruction level parallelism. Oops. I forgot to mention bit level parallelism. Within one multiply, if I want to take two 64-bit numbers and multiply them, there's also a lot of parallel stuff that's going on at the same time. The hardware has done that in parallel for many, many years. The ideas behind it, though, work not just for multiplying numbers. They work for much larger scale operations, and I'll tell you about those. Um, the memory system has parallelism. It's important to sort of not just you know, do your arithmetic and then send a request to the memory to get your data, to do both overlapping. And the hardware does it for you automatically, but it doesn't always do it. And then the operating system also tries to run jobs in parallel on commodity shared memory processors. But uh, again, that won't scale up to the size of machines that we're talking about. So all of these have limits. So, so we still have to have better tools or, or do it by hand. So let me just walk through the, these again in a little bit more detail. So I mentioned finding enough parallelism, and I mentioned Almdahl's law. So here's the algebra behind the observation I made. So suppose I have a sequential problem, and I, I stare at it for a while, and I figure there's a fraction of it, s. It's still sequential. I don't know how to speed it up. But the rest of it, I can parallelize very well. How much faster can I go? So if I have p processors, let me compute the speed up. How much faster can I go? So that's the ratio of the time to run it on one processor divided by the time to run it on p processors. So the time to run it on one processor is just 1. On p, there's a sequential part. That doesn't go any faster. But the parallel part goes p times faster. And this ratio here, it's pretty easy to see that no matter how big I make p, I can't get this fraction above 1 over s. And so the speed up is going to be limited by this part that's done sequentially. And so if you think about the current machines, which have 3 million processors, how big is the sequential part allowed to be to have any hope of getting anywhere near a 3 million fold speed up, right? 1 3 millionth of the code has to be sequential. So that's, that's hard to find. So we have to worry about that problem. So I mentioned the overhead of parallelism, that it's not worth sending one multiply to another processor to ask it to do it and send you back the answer, because there's all this other stuff going on. You have to start up a thread. The op maybe the operating system has to wake up in the other processor in order to say, oh, I'm ready. Give me some work to do. That's a lot more than a multiply. You have to send the data over. That's a whole lot of work. You have to synchronize. You have to make sure that you know, I know when you're done, and you have to send me the answer back. And so these are all just a lot of redundant work, uh, a lot of overhead. So sometimes it actually pays off to do the computation twice on two processors. It's cheaper to do it redundantly than to have them share the, have one processor do it and send it to the other. So sometimes that's an alternative for us. 
And so all of these things can, you know, are in the, take milliseconds to do, which are like millions of floating point operations. So the trade-off here is that we need to send sufficiently large units of work to run in parallel. So they, you know, we're not dominated by this overhead, but we have to keep all the processors busy. That's the problem. So here's a picture about locality. And so here's kind of a cartoon of what processors look like. Here, let me just do the sequential one. That's where all the real work gets done. That's where the multiplier is in the adder. But it doesn't have any memory there. So when it wants to multiply or add something, it has to go get those, those data out of memory. And so what it does is it goes to very close by, very fast, on the same chip, called a cache, gets the two sum ands out of there, adds them, and puts the answer back. Now, this can't be very large because it fits on the chip and it's very close. So what if it's not in there? Well, it'll have to go a little bit farther away, take a little bit longer to something larger called the level two cache. What if it's not there? It keeps on going farther, and eventually it has to go all the way off the chip to memory. So, so here's the analogy. You're sitting at your desk, and you want to write something, and you need a pencil. And so what's the, your first resort is you look at the top of your desk, and if there's a pencil there, you grab it. That's the cache. So what if there's no pencil on your desk? You open a drawer, you look inside, and if there's a box of pencils, you'll reach in, put it on, on top of your desk, and that's the L2 cache. So that takes a little bit longer, but you'll get a box of pencils, so you'll get to reuse them. What if it's not, if your desk is empty, you have to get up, walk down the hall, uh, get into a supply cabinet, you know, grab a big box of pencils, bring it back. And so that's the L2 or the L3 cache. And, and so, but you know, it takes longer, but you get a very big box of pencils. And what if the supply cabinet is empty? Well, eventually you go to the store, you go out in the forest, you cut down a tree and you make pencils, and you know, that's going to disk, right? So, so the, the point is you get a lot more pencils from a tree, but you don't want to do it very often. And the, the same store, and so this is an, an economic thing that happens you know, you know, all the time in the world, you know, inside computers just as well. And it also happens inside parallel computers. Here's the picture of it, because we're not just going down from all these levels of cache. We may also be going across communication networks to get to somebody else's memory to actually get the data. But it's the same story. So here is a picture which says that the memory is getting better. That's this exponential curve. It says that the, that the processors are getting better. There's Moore's law, as I've mentioned before. But they're not getting better at the same rate. And so Moore's law is getting better at this rate. Um, processor performance, the DRAM latency, is getting better at 7% a year. So this, this gap is getting very large. And so even if your program is not memory bound, you know, limited by the speed of the memory this year, maybe next year or the year after that, because these two curves are growing apart. So what this motivates us to do is to look for optimal algorithms, algorithms that provably communicate as little data to memory as possible. And part of what the course will be about is saying, how do you recognize when you've actually spent as provably as little time as possible going down to that memory? Then we know that we can't do any better, or you have to invent a completely different algorithm or, you know, or something. OK, so there, our goal is to find algorithms that minimize this communication. So a little bit more about load imbalance. As I mentioned, if you know, some processors take longer than others, that's a problem. And so how could that happen? Well, one reason is you don't have enough work to keep all the processors busy. So some processors have nothing to do. That's a very bad load imbalance. You're just sitting there burning energy. Or you may have assigned them unequal task sizes. And so that happens pretty commonly in scientific computing. Because if you have an adaptive algorithm, say you're doing adaptive mesh refinement, you have a certain uh, grid that you put down in one part of your domain to, to you know, analyze it. But something interesting happens there. It gets more complicated. You have to put down a finer grid. It takes more work to do. So one processor is going to get more and more work depending on what complicated reactions are going on in that particular part of the domain. And so how do we deal with that? And so there are two techniques that we're going to talk about. One of them is called static load balancing. And the other one is called dynamic load balancing. And the static case is one where you know enough about your code that ahead of time, you can predict exactly how much work it's going to do. It's not going to change dynamically. But you may have to solve a complicated combinatorics problem to, to divide up the work equally. But, and there's a lot of clever ways to do that. We'll talk about that. But sometimes if it does change dynamically, because you know, more work is created somewhere, you have to rebalance during the run. And one common technique there is, is very simple. It's called stealing. So a processor that doesn't have enough work to do will simply talk to its neighbors and say, you got any work for me? And, and it, there are people who have built uh, special purpose compilers and languages just for that purpose. They do it for you automatically. And so sometimes that works well, and you know, sometimes it doesn't. We will talk about that. Now, here is the eventual goal. We would like to have 
th there's never going to be one programming model that makes all programmers happy. So our cartoon is that there's two kinds of programmers. And in this room, both are represented, for sure. There's going to be people who are the ninjas, or sort of people who love to know exactly where the bits are and want to go as fast as possible and want to get you know, that last percentage of peak. And so these experts are going to build certain libraries or frameworks, and they're going to be the tools that are used by everybody else. Most people, like 90% of the programmers, they're not going to be experts at that level. They're going to be experts in their domain, in their physics or their business or their, their, their biology. What they would like to do is, at a much higher level, decompose their code into, let's say, those 13 dwarfs that I was telling you about, and have those mapped to the machine as efficiently as possible using the tools that this 10% of the folks built. Now, you still have to understand your code well enough to decompose it into parts that map well to the machine. And one of the goals of the course is to teach it from both points of view. How do you decompose big applications into these standard parts? and then some time spent on you know, how are they mapped as well as possible to the machine. So this will, and, and you know, we expect you know, over a career, you know, any individual is probably going to be at both layers at certain times. You may, even if you like to build the low level stuff, there's probably some problems you're, go you're going to want to solve where you just want to grab the best solution from somewhere else. So we will talk about how to identify that. Okay, so let me just say a few words about the structure of the course. And there's the web page for it. And uh, you're about half. I, will, I have some uh, uh, anonymized information about all of you. I will show you some statistics about where you all come from. But roughly, you're about half ECS and half non-ECS. That's the way it is almost every semester. We like it that way. We create interdisciplinary teams for the first homework assignment and, uh, so, so that the uh, computer scientists can you know, help the non-computer scientists up the learning curve a little bit there. So the grading is going to, there are going to be uh, three real assignments. There's going to be a warm-up assignment, which is homework zero on the web that's already posted. And what we'd like you to do is build a web page about your favorite problem that you'd like to solve in this field. Like it could be, you know, I want to do climate modeling faster, or, you know, I want a better algorithm for doing, you know, a certain graph algorithm, whatever it is that you like, you know, in any format that you like. And with your permission, we would like to post them. And the purpose of that is so that you can find collaborators, so that you can get to know what other people do in the class, because you say, oh, here are two people, I didn't know you were interested in climate modeling, and then you might want to do your, your final project together. Because half the grade is going to be a final project, which can be a team project. Then there, but after that warm up, there are going to be three programming assignments. That'll take the first half of the semester, and they'll be posted on the web page. And for the first one, as I said, we will team up computer science and non-computer scientists. After that, you can work with whoever you want, or alone if you like to sort of work through some of the basic programming tools that we're going to teach. And the final project could be pretty much anything. You could be paralyzing an application, building or evaluating a tool. I will have a lecture later on you know, how people do class projects. And if you look at the old web pages, that, which are linked from the current web page, they point to many uh, posters that people have um, uh, from previous semesters describing their class projects. There are lots of ideas to look at. Um, you're going to get class accounts on Hopper and Dirac at NERSC. As I said, Hopper is number 29. Edison is a new machine they, they just installed. It actually hasn't run the LINPAC benchmark yet. Maybe they'll you know, do it for the next six months. We'll see how fast it is. And there are going to be some forms to fill out. You have to uh, promise not to do anything too nefarious, being that it's a large federal facility. So. But you should be willing to sign that, I hope. So, um, so as I said, the lectures are all going to be webcast and archived as in past semesters. And Exceed is broadcasting the course this semester, and we have folks at 17 other universities. And so uh, th that gave us an interesting challenge is how do we scale up the, Q the, the Q&A, the question and answer. So for this class, we're going to use Piazza, so, which is a sort of a standard tool that we, I've used many times. Many people have used it many times. And they're going to use a different tool called Moodle for the Exceed folks. But there could be some sharing if we decide to get people together. Um, we're going to have auto graders, so you can submit your program over and over again to see, oh, did I do it right? And so it'll both do correctness testing and performance testing. So here, so let me uh, ask uh, the, the GSIs, Razvan and Aditya, to uh, sort of talk about logistics for a minute or two. Hello, everyone. So I'm Razvan Karnesko, and this is Aditya. Hey. Um, so with respect to the forms, there's actually going to be online forms. You can uh, go from the web page. There's going to be a link for you uh, to fill out a form. And after that, we're going to add you to the NERSC account, and you're also going to fill out then a form saying that you won't do anything bad at NERSC, and uh, that's also going to be linked. Um, with respect to the homeworks, um, the, the first one's up. Um, 
with respect to the auto graders, there are there are some auto graders, but they're not as automatic as you would, might like. The same way as auto tuning, you're going to find out is not as automatic. <laughs> And what else did we have? So, so the, the trick about correctness is that one of your assignments is going to be paralyzing bouncing billiard balls. And if you change the code just very slightly, you know, change the time step, uh, then they can bounce in a completely different direction and be in a completely different location in a few steps, even though it's correct. Correct, right? So what does correctness mean? So we, th that's an open research question. How do you test the correctness of these forward, unstable parallel codes? So we have an approximation for the purpose of this class. <laughs> Uh, just a couple of things. Um, for students who are on the wait list, um, sign up for the Piazza site. Uh, so there are a couple of announcements and links to the, um, to the two surveys that we have posted. One is a class demographic just to get you know, a feel for what your background is in CS, so on and so forth. Um, and the other one is, of course, to get access to NERSC. Um, but otherwise, uh, assignment zero is up and posted, so you can take a look um, and get started. One of the questions on the survey is whether you took uh, Phil Colella's CS 294 class to sort of prepare for this. And because and we're trying to see how good a job that is doing in preparing people. So yes, so please fill that out. Um, anything else? So let me just say, here is the uh, rough list of topics. We're going to spend several you know, lectures doing sort of low level uh, stuff about what do shared memory machines look like and what does multi-threading look like. This is multi-core. Then we'll wor work our way up to distributed memory and message passings. This is sort of like programming in MPI. We'll also talk, have a lecture on GPUs from a former graduate student who now works at NVIDIA, because so using GPUs is certainly also an option uh, for some of your assignments or your final project. And we'll also have a lecture on cloud computing, uh, because that is yet another model that people use. Um, so these are the programming tools that we will talk about. Uh, so as I said, OpenMP, MPI, various other frameworks. And people have built many frameworks that are, that are sort of fair game for folks to use. Then we'll work our way through those seven or 13 dwarfs. It depends on how much time there is. And talk about how, what are the optimal algorithms that people have found so far. And we probably won't have time to do all of these other ones, but we will have a lecture on parallel graph algorithms because there's been an enormous amount of progress in those in the last few years. We'll talk about some general purpose techniques like auto-tuning and load balancing. And then we'll have special guest lectures on uh, things like climate modeling, material science, and astrophysics. So see you next time. <laughs>